Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. Welcome back to the show, everybody. And this is our inaugural episode for my new series called Gloves Off, where essentially you can think of taking, let's say, a WWE or UFC fight night and combining it with election night coverage, except for medicine. We invite physicians on to cover a procedure and share their favorite tips and approaches along with their favorite products. So our first one, we're doing it in the orthopedic world. It's called Total Knee. We're doing this with Dr. Matt Barber and Dr. Paul B. Jacob. We're going to be doing a lot of different episodes and specialties. We got cardiovascular coming up. We're going to be doing one in the GI space with scopes. But let me tell you a little bit about our uh, two guests today. So Dr. Paul Jacob is a fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon who specializes in total reconstruction of hip and knee joints. Native of Akron, Ohio. He attended medical school at Ohio University and completed fellowship training at the world-renowned Cleveland Clinic. Currently, his practice in Oklahoma serves both adult and geriatric patients. And then Dr. Matt Barber, many of you know him from his uh, fantastic podcast, Ortho Real. So Dr. Barber is a orthopedic surgeon that practices out of Alabama. His education includes doing his MD at the University of South Alabama College of Medicine, his residency at University of South Alabama Hospitals, and then he did his fellowship all the way over in Arizona Institute for Bone and Joint Disorders. And of course, if you're listening to this and you're a clinician, you can unlock a free CME credit uh, as long as you click the link below and reflect on what did you learn and what will you do. And of course, these are free, so please sure to enjoy and, and share with other people. And if you are a um, medical device company or biotech company, you're looking to sponsor some of these episodes, whether they're live or post, we're starting to open this up for sponsorship. So if you're interested, send me a message at omar at kativenco.com or uh, just hit me up on LinkedIn. And of course, we're also looking for ideas. So some sponsors you know, from this recent one came forward and asked if we would be open to put one on using some of their KOLs. I'm very open to that as long as I'm able to pick some non-KOLs of the company, right? So that way we have some healthy debate you know, as well. Um, but again, we're very open to uh, different ideas. So please be sure to uh, hit me up. And Lastly, if you're a surgeon or physician, especially if you're an orthopedic surgeon, um, I launched a course to teach people how to become digital opinion leaders online, specifically LinkedIn. This course is really applicable to everybody, but the main one was started uh, with orthopedic surgery. So you can go and get 25 CME credits just from going through this course and reflecting. And of course, it's a fantastic course because it'll tell you how to set up your LinkedIn and grow it the way that Paul Jacob or Matt Barber or any of these great orthopedic surgeons online have done. So be sure to go to orthodigitalopinionleader.com and get enrolled in the course now. We also have a private group, so that way when you start posting, you have a group of people that are gonna be supportive of you and engage with your content. So that's orthodigitalopinionleader.com. Go check it out. Now, without further ado, we're gonna jump to the episode. And by the way, just a tiny side note, um, because we sort of do a, you know, as indicated by Gloves Off, a WWE, UFC sort of fight night uh, 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 branding to this, um, what you're going to hear first is me introducing Dr. Matt Barber and Dr. Paul Jacob uh, with fighting games. You know, we got to make this fun. You know, medicine uh, can be a little bit stuffy, right? And so if we're going to talk about products and procedures. We want to make this really entertaining and fun. So here it is. And if you have any uh, suggestions for future episodes, people you want to see, if you're watching this on Spotify or YouTube, go ahead and look below. You can leave a comment for me. We always read all those comments and engage. So without further, without further ado, here is our first inaugural episode of Gloves Off, featuring the total knee with Drs. Matt Barber and Dr. Paul B. Jacob. Enjoy. From the deserts of Oklahoma, where bones are as tough as sandstorms all the way to the OR squared circle. He's got the camel clutch on every fracture and dislocation. He'll reset your joints while earning his points. They say every bone tells a story, and with him, they all end in glory. 
on the stage now we got dr paul the iron chic jacob dr jacob thank you so much for joining us how are you i'm doing great thanks for having me fantastic i'm going to pull you off for for the stage for one second and up next he'll twist and shout and make all your ligaments know what it's all about making bones dance and patience prance he's the one that'll give every knee a second chance with moves slicker than rick flair he's the oracle world's breath of fresh air i bring to the stage matt the nature boy barber matt dr barber good to see you Woo! never had a better intro thank you omar fantastic gentlemen let let's just be honest do you get that kind of intro at any conferences i mean it's not going to get better than that right no. never happened no Fan although i'm a little jealous i think i like matt's better than mine so we're gonna have to work on it <laughs> oh I, totally so I'll pay him in advance for that yeah, <laughs> work side deals. let me give a few more shout outs to our audience here we got uh hank summit from uh, saint pete andrew arbuckle that's a that's a wrestling name right there andrew j arbuckle that's a great name from denver colorado we got benjamin garth all the way from brisbane australia daniel McElmurray from lubbock texas shauna cunningham from springfield missouri Dr. Manish Patel, there we go. Manish Patel, aka Jiffy Knee Doc, there we go. I love it from Suffolk, Virginia. Keep keep bringing in everybody. We'll allow for some Q and A's at some point, but let's go ahead and get started. So today's topic, we're going to be talking about total knees because I heard they're the bee's knees. It's like really bad ortho jokes. That bad <laughs> ortho dad jokes, guys. I'm sorry. So we'll be covering total knee today. So. Let's go ahead and get started. And again, we're gonna, you know, I'll bring people, uh, you know, off and on. But let me, uh, let's go ahead and get started with uh, pre-operative planning and imaging. Um, so whoever wants to take take it first, go ahead. Matt, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'll, I'll get started. I'm a striker Mako user, so I'm the guy struggling to get the the CT scans prior to surgery. Although, you know, I've heard that. Um, you know, there's been challenges. I'm lucky enough to either be in a generous market where I haven't had to fight it very much or just lucky to have a really good staff that doesn't let me know when we're struggling to get a, a CT approved. But uh, I do get uh, robotic CT prior to surgery. Uh, I think that the majority of my imaging is pretty um, straightforward. I learned from some of what I think are the world's best uh, orthopedic surgeons and, and certainly arthroplasty surgeons. And so I get my standard four view total knee. I do get a Rosenberg view. I always get weight bearing views and I get a full length lower extremity film a la Victor Krebs at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, that's always been uh, an undervalued part of my practice. And um, and I, I, I certainly think it's a, an essential thing uh, for pre-op planning. Yeah, so same. I mean, starting off four views, uh, weight bearing views, as you said, PA flexion view uh, for me in there. Um, you know, three dimensional imaging, I've done a lot of that as well. I'm in an area like a lot where CTs are routine approval of CT is just going away. Uh, and there were some workarounds for that for a while, and that seems to be going away as well. So that's getting tougher and tougher. I uh, have done and do uh, MAKO cases, um, PSI cases, both MRI and CT based. And uh, I'm involved in a project right now, uh, developing PSI guides using uh, 2D x-rays and AI. Uh, so I, I do think uh, for robotics, for PSI, for a lot of these, at some point, uh, we're going to make that transition. We're going to get away from the the more expensive imaging, and we're going to use AI to take 2D to 3D uh, in a way that still uh, carries over for some of these advanced technologies. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask you a quick question. It's a technology I've been really, really interested in lately. I'm surprised, actually, it hasn't made a bigger presence in orthopedics yet, but uh, weight-bearing cone beam CT scan or three-dimensional X-ray, uh, some would call it. Um, I've uh, been involved with a couple of companies, um, one out of Finland, then one here based in the U.S., that are basically taking that cone beam CT scan that you get in the dentist's or oral surgeon's office and doing a full body scan. 
um, in weight bearing to evaluate both deformity uh, and certainly uh, items that you wouldn't get in a two-dimensional image. Um, and so I, I think that's something that's pretty exciting. I'm anxious to get my hands on it. It's a pretty affordable technology from a cost basis, something that you could have as cheaply in your office as a, uh, you know, a plain film x-ray or PAC system. The nice thing about it is from a radiation standpoint, you often don't need it in a shielded room. It's pretty small from a footprint standpoint. And certainly, uh, man, it gives you some great detail. There's not great coding and reimbursement yet, but I think that's something that'll come as the interest from our the industry side uh, comes into play. I think that is interesting and the potential to do some of that loaded uh, that some of our spine and foot and ankle colleagues have, have sort of been exploring a little more so than we have uh, on the arthroplasty side, at least with the, with the three-dimensional imaging mm -hmm. or the reconstructed you know, two-dimensional imaging. Yeah, HSS has uh, really been kind of leading the way there um, with that three-dimensional imaging technology from an, a, a joint replacement standpoint. They're doing some pretty exciting stuff, and I love to see the cutting-edge uh, new. I'm, I love new. I'm also probably uh, fairly reluctant to uh, adopt brand-new technology. Um, I've, I, a very wise older surgeon once told me, never be the first, never be the last. Um, and so I've always tried to fit in somewhere in the middle while still staying up on the latest technology, uh, keeping my patients safe same time. Yeah, I think that's fair. And I, I think you, you certainly, we have the, the luxury as you and I were talking about of being in private practice settings where we get to try a lot of different things and both of us uh, fairly high volume uh, knee replacement. So you, you've got the opportunity with most of these to sort of learn the, the technology incrementally uh, with a lot of uh, easy bailouts close mm -hmm. at hand. All right, it looks like we're ready to move on from this topic, yeah? All right, next one, approach and incision. I know that we discussed this before that uh, both of you felt like there's not much to, talk, to, to, to touch on this, but you know, let's, let's touch on it for a second before we move, uh, move on to the main, main, main areas. Matt, I'd love to hear what you have. I, I think our talking points before we got started were really, really good. I was kind of learning some new stuff, even just listening. Yeah, well, so uh, I, I saw uh, Manish is in the chat there. I, I think he'll act, absolutely have a seizure if we say there's uh, there's nothing new going on or everything is medial parapetellar arthrotomy. Uh, but that's uh, that's certainly the workhorse uh, for me for most total knees. I still do uh, an occasional subvastus, you know, a smaller patient that I think might be a good candidate. Uh, not had a, a lot of previous arthrotomy or surgery, um, not with uh, bad patella baja. Un unclear to me how much they benefit. You know, I, I think good exposure and good surgery and good soft tissue balancing is is the whole game. If you can do that through smaller incisions, um, great. I, I, there are certainly some people out there marketing lateral approaches now. Uh, I told you guys I got a call from uh, a spine surgeon colleague of mine that was, hey, I'm talking to a buddy and he's getting his knee uh, put in from the side. Uh, can you even do that? And I said, well, okay, Here, here's what's going on. Um, and there may be a little bit of marketing behind that too. So I, I'm obviously anxious to hear your thoughts as well, Paul. What are you doing? Yeah, you know, I'm, I, um, when I first got to town, I thought, uh, you know, hey, I'm the adult recon fellowship trained guy. I got to do something special. I got to make small incisions. I got to do subvastus approaches, mini midvastus. Uh, I've got to explore the newest, latest, and greatest stuff. Um, you know, oftentimes the incision is all that the patient sees. And a big incision means sometimes not as good a surgery as a tiny little incision, regardless of the patient's early outcome. Um, but I learned really quick to never let the skin get in the way of a good surgery. So I don't mind. I'm, I'm, my workhorse is a medial parapetellar. I do a mini midvastus and the occasional subvastus uh, in very select uh, patients. I started out doing a subvastus on everybody, uh, and I learned really quick that uh, the approach doesn't quite have as much to do with the the outcome as we would you know, like to think, 
And so I went back to what I could do the best and the safest and the most reproducible. And certainly I think as some of the newer technology has come along um, in alignment and balancing and some new thought has gone into the way we align and balance total knees, I certainly see way more advantage uh, from those technologies and advances than I do in making a, a one inch smaller skin incision. 100% and my mentor, uh, one of, he had a, a million quotes, uh, some <laughs> of which are repeatable. Um, <laughs> But uh, that was one of them that, that minimally invasive surgery was was the equivalent of sometimes of uh, throwing a hand grenade in through a porthole mm -hmm. um, where you, you really there was just more trauma associated mm -hmm. with it, uh, despite the skin incision. So I, I totally am with you on that. We want to do good yeah. surgery. You know, I, I remember as a resident, there was um, a big push and I can't remember. I'm, I apologize for not recalling the implant company, but they they called it the mobile window incision and they had cutting guides that would slide back and forth as you made cuts on the medial and lateral side and you would kind of make this tiny little incision and mobilize the quote unquote window. And I thought as a resident, that was just the coolest thing. We're doing this work through a tiny little incision. I couldn't see a thing. I pretended like I knew what was going on. I was terrified the entire time. Uh, I, and I will tell you, hands down, it was some of the, those patients struggled mightily uh, the first two or three days in the hospital, much more than what I saw from some of the other uh, surgeons and their incisions. And I, I learned a lot from that. Um, you know, sometimes a sexy little incision doesn't always equal a good outcome. Awesome. And you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that just because. Um, I think a lot of people get caught up with the aesthetics of surgery and I think the, the point of surgery is to get the patient as close back to normal as possible and you may not have an aesthetically pleasing looking incision but you know I think that's I think that's a really important point um, before I bring up the uh, next one which is the bone resection and alignment we had an interesting question in the crowd and I can't help but bring it up because I and again this is called gloves off for a reason so have at it so you, you guys ready for this we go so we got uh, a couple of couple of good ones that came up. Uh, one is from Jay Benson. So Jay says, "Any exposure to ROSA robotics in imageless cases?" Uh, for me, I've I, I have at least performed one uh, procedure with just about every robotic platform available in the U.S. Um, and and I'll tell you, I have a really strong. You know, I, I, I'll just. You know, I'm full, full disclosure, I'm a striker consultant. I have gone full in on, drank every bit of the Kool-Aid uh, on uh, Mako, uh, but I do think there is some s really slick technology out there. Um, I, I think the ROSA, uh, I was very unimpressed, just to be honest with you, as it launched. I think there was some market pressure for Zimmer to launch a robotic platform maybe before they were ready to do that. This is my personal opinion. Please take it with a grain of salt. Um, but I've watched them grow and push the industry forward. I think there's some exciting potential with imageless robotics in general, not just from the ROSA. My concern is the same uh, error that we had with navigation, which is the garbage in, garbage out phenomenon, is uh, the same error can be made with imageless robotics. There's no double check, right? So if you're not careful and you work quickly uh, and you don't get great points and you don't give the platform good data, there is no way for that platform to double check to make sure that that data is correct. So you have the potential for that garbage in, garbage out phenomenon and you get your post-op x-ray and go, what happened? And you look at your rep and, you know, of course we've all, you know, partially brain, blame, blamed our rep for, for some situations like that or the robotic tech, but um, th that's what I worry about the most until we can solve that um, that particular error um, with imageless technology. I think there's always going to be the potential for poor outcomes. 
Yeah, and I've, I've dabbled a little bit with a lot of different robots, I'll, I'll confess, not having done uh, Rosa on uh, patients. Um, I think Imageless is interesting for all the reasons that we talked about um, with difficulty with getting the three-dimensional imaging uh, played on some cadavers with uh, Corey from Smith Nephew uh, doing uh, sort of those off-rail uh, revision surgeries, uh, Imageless, um, and, and where you can really take a take a survey of those implants and, and position and um, what what bone is left. Um, and I think that's got some some real potential. So that's one of those things, I guess, the imageless part of it to see uh, where that crosses into what's going on already. I think there's some some exciting stuff coming. I love I love I think the core is a great technology. Smith and nephews really got something there. I love that they've gone smaller. Um, instead of bigger, they haven't attached it to a giant robot with a bunch of technology. But I think there's some potential, um, and without giving away too much, you know, with uh, your iPhone face recognition technology, that same technology I think can be applied to uh, a the anatomy of a knee, and that can be where that double check comes from. Um, and I think well, that some, image mapping uh, is is the basis for AI two D to three D. Right. Same, yep. same, same thing we're familiar with for facial recognition. Mm -hmm. We got another. We got another one. I'm going to take uh, one. We'll take one more. Say so for for the audience who's listening. If you have a question or you agree or disagree, and again, just like keynote here because we have this uh, streaming right now on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, the more provocative, the better, right? And so uh, we have Manish, Patel, uh, Dr. Patel says, why cut the muscles or tendons if you can do the same procedure with great exposure, keeping everything else the same? Um, gentlemen, have at it. I don't cut too many muscles or tendons, even doing a medial peripatellar approach. So uh, I'll tell you, I, I'm not against, um, you know, hearing and exploring new technology and new approaches. I just don't think the advances that are going to be made over the next 10 years are going to be made in the approach or um, in the way we expose a, a knee. I think it's coming from um, robotics, it's coming from technology, it's coming from implants, it's coming from material, um, and that's what, what I'm most excited about. Well, and I think some of it's coming from uh, biology, from patient optimization, from optimizing uh, rehabilitation, from really understanding on a personalized level what we're doing, which you know goes back to some of those customized uh, alignment strategies and things like that. Um, same. I mean, I, I'm open to it, um, and, and certainly, you know, it, it's for for which patient. And, and we talk about total needs as this giant patient population and. And they, it is that giant patient population, but they're real different. Uh, there, there are patients with minimal deformity, you know, that come into the office with a zero to 115 degree range of motion and they've got uh, some cartilage wear. And then I see patients just on the regular with a 10 or a 15 degree flexion contracture that can't even bend to 90. They're, they're obese, uh, everything is contracted. Uh, there's osteophytes everywhere. Um, I'm hard pressed to, to necessarily think that I'm doing them a service uh, with a, you know, a so-called minimally invasive approach, even if I, if I quote unquote can. Mm. Dr. Patel, I, I want to, I just want to say, I, I uh, beyond the term Jiffy Knee, I don't know much about what what he does and and how he does it, although I've seen all kinds of LinkedIn information recently. So I will I will give a, a disclaimer that I'd love to know more and learn more and I'm open to it, um, but that's where my thoughts are. It's a good, you know, I don't know if he if he coordinated with you. That was a really good endorsement because I'm supposed to have a meeting with him uh, next week. He had reached out and so I'm, I'm curious to learn more. So that, Dr. Patel, that, that worked in your favor right there. So that worked. All right, moving forward, the audience is lit. This is This is a great audience, by the way. Um, so moving forward, um, let's go to the bone resection and alignment. Yeah, I, I'd love to start here. I've, I've just recently put together a talk for uh, for Academy this year on this very topic. You can call it functional alignment. You can call it patient-specific alignment. Um, there is so much out there. 
gosh, I mean, I feel like I read something in, in about arthroplasty every single day, and I can't keep up on the, all the alignment and balancing and kinematic, reverse kinematic. Everybody's got great data. It's, I, I think we're really, this is an exciting time for the rethought process of balancing a total knee, and I really do think we're on to something. I am really a hardcore believer in, uh, you know, functional alignment or patient-specific alignment. I really like taking the patient's um, native alignment, really categorizing them into one of nine particular boxes, um, and then trying to reproduce their native anatomy uh, in a way that makes their knee feel like a native knee, not like a mechanical device. I, I rarely shoot for uh, mechanical alignment or what we've traditionally been taught is uh, the appropriate alignment. And I find that often those patients uh, are unhappy even when the so-called x-rays look perfect. That's a looks good, feels bad knee in my clinic. And I think uh, some of the most exciting advances I've made in my personal practice are in getting away from the dogma associated with, um, you know, a neutral tibial resection and five to seven degrees of valgus on the distal femur and making the x-rays look good. Yeah, so you kind of hit on it. There's all those different terms for it because nobody knows what it is. Um, <laughs> and everybody's kind of defining it a different way. And obviously, you know, I've said this and I've had Steve Howell on the podcast, and we've talked about uh, kinematic alignment that I think he, you know, legitimately can can claim to use that word, and it has a particular meaning in his context. But for the rest of us, we're, we're talking about something personalized, inverse kinematic alignment. Uh, my personal, you know, sort of pet theory is that we're really, we're chasing balance and stability, uh, a knee that moves well, it's very stable throughout a very full range of motion. It doesn't have condylar lift off. It doesn't have these kinematic conflicts and these things that, that make it hurt. Um, and it has stability. And what these discussions have done is open our minds to, okay, what if that tibia has two degrees of varus in it now? Well, I, I think we're at, at a point that you know nobody cares anymore or is gonna sweat that. And so it's opened our mind to that. And then, you know, what to do with that and how to really have a systematic way to address it is probably the holy grail, right, of, of we're taking a CPAC classification or some way of looking at these knees preoperatively and then somehow with either one of these technologies that we're using, robotics or something else, you've got data about where they were pre-op, where they were post-op, and somebody's correlating that back to outcomes data and giving us something that that drives us from the front end to reproduce that. But I, I do think that the balance and stability um, is the key, that, that ligament isometry uh, as, a, as a measure of patient satisfaction. Yeah, I, you know, I, I used to give a speech to every patient uh, before I did a total knee, I'd say, um, what we're gonna give you is something that's better than the knee you have today, but not as good as the knee you had when you were 18. And I don't give that speech anymore. And I believe that we're pretty darn close to reproducing that patient's native anatomy in whatever way um, that you do that best. Um, I, I find that many times my balancing fits beautifully in the kinematic alignment box. But two patients later, I might do try and do that same technique and really end up with a mechanical aligned knee yeah. or a uh, traditionally gap balanced knee. Uh, I think it's, it depends on the amount of deformity, the soft tissue that you're working with and so many factors. So it depends on all those things. And you're, you're using an implant that has a single radius on the femur that, you mm -hmm. know, relative to anatomy has one condyle that's bigger than it should be and one condyle that's smaller than it should be. Other systems with asymmetric joint lines, you've got medial pivot out there, everybody is chasing this down different ways. And at the end of the day, I think that that true, easily balanced stability all the way through the range of motion where we're really considering not just extension, not just flexion or even mid flexion, but this this infinite number of points that, that the knee is rotating around 
and has got coronal alignment different at all those places and has got uh, translational forces different at all those places. Um, we've got to consider those and, and figure out how to how to make it balance all the way through. Yeah, I think uh, it's pretty exciting to watch some of the data coming out on medial pivot polyethylenes. I think the holy grail is to make a medial pivot knee that you don't need the polyethylene to force that knee to pivot medially. Um, you reproduce native kinematics. You allow the anatomy of the knee to do what it's designed to do. I think that feels more uh, natural or more native. But I'm excited to see the medial pivot poly data come out. It really is, I think, teaching us a lot about how important that medial column is and how uh, essential a balanced, at least medial column, is to a normal feeling total knee. Gents, we got a couple of interesting questions I'd love to bring up before we move on. Uh, so one of them is uh, Chris Franz. He says, uh, "How much internal external rotation are you comfortable putting into a femur?" I was going to say, uh, you know, I, I, I'm pretty liberal on this answer. Uh, I bet my answer is quite a bit different than yours. I have gotten away from the dogma of worrying about uh, how much internal or external rotation. I have the luxury of uh, three-dimensional templating uh, when I do a Mako. So what I really focus on is I, I think one of the most essential parts of what I do in the OR is reproducing the posterior condylar offset. And so if I can reproduce posterior condylar offset, I have a single radius design, total knee, and in the transverse view, I reproduce my patellofemoral compartment in its rotation and not overstuff. I think I, at that point, I, that's the holy grail for me um, in the operating room this is what I shoot for with every knee. So I focus very little on um, the amount of external, even internal, you know, rotation that, the, you know, one of the tenets of orthopedic surgery, thou shall not internally rotate. Um, I, I will say I, I break that rule um, as frequently as I need to to get the job done. Yeah, and I'll even unpack that a little bit and come back and ask the question at the beginning is, uh, internally or externally rotated relative to what? So I think you do need to understand that traditional instrumentation in knees, we were probably looking at a lot of things because we didn't have three-dimensional imaging or because we didn't have other ways to assess this. So posterior condylar axis that is, you know, certainly with, with manual instruments affected by cartilage wear, um, epicondylar axis, which our judgment of it you know, with an eyeball has a lot of variability and then you've got white side line in there as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, how, how I'm, I'm comfortable altering that. Um, certainly we want to keep the patellofemoral joint in mind. And I think that's, that's been a, an observation or criticism even of some people switching over to kinematic alignment is, is having some, some patellofemoral issues or more so than they were used to. How often are you getting crazy numbers with that, Paul, where you're seeing big? Sure. Yeah. Very rare. It really, honestly, it exists in big deformity cases. And But when yeah. I'm getting crazy odd numbers, I take a step back and yeah. I start to look at the soft tissue. And I realize in m many of those cases, it's a soft tissue issue that I need to correct before I go back yeah. and work and balance through bone. We, we, we've had a lot of things that were sort of these these surrogate measures for us trying to find the epicondylar axis, which especially if you're using that single radius knee, you know, you're, you're finding that that axis for your cylinder right on the femur that then the, the half cylinder or half pipe of the tibia is rotating around. You know, it's, a, it's interesting. I, I think I've seen some data on, you know, um, some of the experts, uh, guys I respect a ton in our industry and uh, they get a probe and they're told find the medial, find the trans epicondylar axis. Right. And they're off 70% of the time significantly. Yeah, it's and, hugely, you know, uh, inter, uh, the variability of that and our assessment of that is huge and that's very yeah. well documented. And I, you know, even when you have a CT scan, sometimes finding uh, those are, who are somewhat it, challenging. Who called that axis? That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. 
Gents, I got uh, one more interesting question, and we're going to move on. Uh, so Stephen Bum says, are you seeing more patients with prior ACL recon? What cons- what are considerations or implications? You know, I, I do a decent amount of unis, um, and I used to really sweat out. Um, I do a fixed-bearing uni, um, and I used to really sweat out the ACL and, and the function of the ACL and the quality of the ACL. And if they um, – I will tell you early on in my – um, venture with partial knees. I did what I think many surgeons do, which is I was a little afraid of it. Technically, it's a little bit more demanding. Then I got one or two really, really good outcomes. And then I made everybody into a uni for a while. And I had a chance to train in Columbus, Ohio and, and get a get a good view at what Keith Barron was doing in, in New Albany. And, and uh, you know, I drank a little bit of that Kool-Aid um, and so for, for uni patients, I, I paid a lot of attention to the ACL. And then I started to see some data come out from some brave souls who said, mm, maybe maybe ACL isn't as important as we think, as, at least for a fixed bearing uni. Now I'm starting to see some data on the mobile bearing uni saying, hey, ACL, probably not that important, uh, even in the mobile bearing uni uh, universe. Um, and so from a total knee standpoint, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the ACL other than um, I do uh, use a lot of cementless uh, technology. And so in a previous ACL patient, if that ACL tunnel is looking a little expansive, um, I'm, I'm out on press fitting those. I've seen those fail at a, at a higher than, than I would like clip. Um, but for me, it's, I'm paying a lot of attention uh, for unis although less important now than it's ever been in my practice. Yeah, same. I mean, they're always there. I mean, it, just the ACL rupture and the, the essentially partial dislocation that the knee goes through with that is, is inherently traumatic to the knee, and tons of those patients end up with post-traumatic arthritis. Um, same technical considerations as Paul. Uh, I have done cementless with, you know, autografting of the cuts in those holes, but, you know, very uh, quick trigger to a a shorty cemented stem on those uh, in the tibia. Um, And, you know, we see them and we're going to see them when I was a fellow. Um, My mentor had a a partner from from long ago that had done the synthetic grafts. I think they were Dacron or something. And when you when you put a reamer in the tibia, it was just like a mass of rubber bands coming out uh, everywhere. Uh, but they cleaned up and they did fine with their total knee. So uh, we're always going to see that, I think, and it's it's manageable. You know, I'm in a, in a group of great, a great group of sports medicine guys. I'm right now one of two arthroplasty surgeons in, in, in we're far outnumbered by our sports colleagues. And uh, every once in a while, I'll get a really good look at meniscus or a clean looking ACL and I'll cut it out and have one of the scrub techs bring it to him on a blue towel and say, Hey, Dr. Jacob wanted you to know that this is the only right way to treat a meniscus t- tear or an ACL tear. And, uh, it really, it really, I enjoy it. it gets their goat every time. That's amazing. I, That's I've done amazing. that in the surgery center as well. I don't think in our <laughs> hospital, I, I could send, uh, send that to the other room. You know, it's, uh, it's classic arthroplasty jokes. <laughs> Dr. Barber, real quick before we move forward, I wanted to ask you a question specifically. So, Dr. Dr. Jacobin mentioned that you know he uh, he's a consultant, but also he's you know drank the Mako Kool Aid. For you, um, do you are you partial to any specific navigation or robotic technologies when it comes to you know comes to your alignment, or or is it case by case basis? I mean, how do you feel about it? Uh, you put me on the spot here. I got a lot of friends uh, here right. and a lot of these. <laughs> so I ask I'm, questions and I disappear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I'll tell the truth here. This is this is gloves off. Um, I, I done and still do Mako. I uh, do Mako unis or, or have. Um, Mako total knee was, was not my jam. Um, I use a lot of different strategies right now. I love uh, IntelliJoint for navigation, uh, just super efficient, fast able to make some of those uh, sort of customized alignment uh, type decisions of little varus on the tibia, maybe a little bit on the femur, um, control my slope, control uh, some of those things real well. Um, I've I've seen and used uh, a lot of the robotic systems. I've been uh, done some uh, validation and I'm in the limited market release right now for the Think Surgical uh, T-Mini handheld robot. 
uh, pretty excited about that. That just kind of continues to impress uh, in its uh, 1.0 iteration here. And I think that's going to grow uh, handheld, open platform, very interesting, some, some changes in some versus some previous robotic systems, um, having the, um, call it the camera, if you will, overhead instead of to the side of the field uh, is game changing in terms of workflow. Uh, that That's made a lot of things better in the OR. Um, and then some kind of unintended things. I, I, I'm not sure that I haven't ended up liking a, a block uh, more than a haptic arm. Uh, that, that's an individual thing and the preference thing. Uh, but but there's a lot of a lot of good and potentially great systems out there that are continuing to evolve. I'll pick your brain. I, I, I have a good friend and colleague who was actually a rep when I was a resident. His name's Jesse Klein. He's a now working for Think. And yeah, I love Jesse and I, I have a lot of confidence in, in what he tells me. Um, and uh, he's pretty excited about what Think is doing. I haven't had a chance to hold that device in my hand, but I see some really exciting potential in the ASC setting and some smaller, you know, community hospitals that just can't um, bring a larger uh, footprint uh, robotic platform to the OR. Um, I, do you do you see it that fitting in in that scenario? Yeah, um, I don't. Smaller footprint is always better. I'm blessed that our ASC has some pretty large rooms, so that's not a huge consideration. But I, I think the the handheld aspect, kind of like you touched on uh, with Corey earlier, is is nice, and you're you're sort of untethered, uh, if you will, with that system. And for smaller systems, for ASCs. The open platform part is huge. Uh, so people that want to use uh, some companies that may be willing to be a little bit more price competitive is going to be big in the ASC. And when you're open platform, you don't have to have every surgeon bought into the same thing. So mm. you know, it's not a question of, all right, we're in this facility, be it a hospital or an ASC, we've got a herd, three, six, eight, you know, whatever surgeons on to all right, do we want a robot? All right, what robot do we want to use? All right, are we all agreed that we're okay using this robot and this implant? So uh, that's you think, gonna add you a think lot that, of dimension. Do you think Think Surgical stays open platform? Ooh, good question. Yes, I, I think I think it's been the hallmark and, you know, I mean, obviously Stuart Simpson, the CEO was, you know, he was at ground zero at Stryker um, and involved in everything with, with rolling out Mako. Um, and I, I think that's, that's pretty, pretty tantamount to their, their success. I think the interesting thing um, is going to be to see if one of the, the big four blink and agree to, uh, to let their product go on that platform. Yeah, I think, you know, compete with their own robot in some sense in order to, to sell the implant. I haven't I haven't released the episode. Stuart Simpson came on my show and I, I believe I I'm almost certain. Yeah, we touched on this topic and he had mentioned that that they have they, they have every intention just to keep it as an open platform. And I think that's the way to go, to be honest with you. I think 10 years ago when robotics first came out of the market, it was smart to say, hey, we're going to build the robot, let people use it, but then we're going to make it exclusive to our implants. And I don't think you can get away with that business model these days anymore, even if you're a striker or a Zimmer. Mm -hmm. And I think they're going to have to change because at the end of the day, the market's going to dictate what it's willing to put up with, especially considering how many orthopedic surgeons are opening their own ASCs and everything. I mean, I don't know. How do you both feel about that? Is that uh, this is an interesting time in the orthopedic market because what used to be the big four or the big five which had a stranglehold on what we did, certainly from, you know, an arthroplasty standpoint, as social media and marketing and, and all that starts to open up. I see uh, the potential there for smaller companies to really get uh, and gain market share from simple marketing techniques like, like you know, Monogram did a an awesome job of fundraising through Facebook and some of the social media. I, at least once a day, I have a patient ask me, should they invest um, in that company? And, and I think it's interesting. It has really opened things up for some of the smaller guys to compete and get their 
product out there, even in front of surgeons. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think, yeah, they did, that was a very interesting uh, equity crowd. It's a rare one. So a lot of companies, they come to me, they're like, we want to raise 20, you know, I think it was 22 million like monogram. I'm like, well, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot, a lot that has to go right for that to happen. So, you know, one of these, you know, for these, I got to do one of these in person, you know, so you guys are next to each other. I'll be more fun. All right. So next one, this is, this is the, this is the, uh, this is the spicy one that I've been wanting to bring up. So you guys ready? Implant selection and positioning. So um, where, where do you got, so there's a plethora of implant, you know, implants that are available in the market. So first of all, aside from picking the right one, well, I'll put it this way. Tell us which ones you, you, you usually, you know, like to use, how do you pick? But then if I had to tell you, Hey, you got 50 patients coming in and in this world, you have to just pick one implant, regardless of what you're going to see, what do you end up going with? So talk about your selection, which ones your preferences, which ones you like. And then if everything was on the table, you got 50 patients coming through, which company are you going with? Well, but, you know, I guess I, I've already, the cat's out of the bag for me. I'm a triathlon user. I love what Stryker does. Uh, I was a four or five, maybe six year user of Zimmer technology. I trained on mainly on Zimmer technology. Uh, I got exposure to Stryker at the Cleveland Clinic when I did my fellowship. But I'll be honest, and, and I'm going to get myself into some trouble here. I'm probably going to cost myself some money. But for me, when I first got to town, the representation that Stryker had was uh, above and beyond what the other implant companies were kind of providing me with. My rep was exceptional. He had two of everything at every case. He double-checked x-rays. He would run things by me. Uh, I felt like he was as vested in the patient's excellent outcome as I was. And now my makeup product specialist, my robotic tech, uh, Sam, she is amazing. Uh, she's catching things two weeks before I do, bringing them to my attention, making sure that every I is dotted, every T is crossed. Uh, I have supreme confidence in my striker team. And more than anything, including robotic technology and implants, that is most important to me. The trust that I've developed with my uh, rep, my sales team, and the representation they provide is if they had the best robot in the world and terrible reps, I wouldn't use them, period. And so that's, for me, the number one reason I'm a triathlon user. Beyond that, I'm a big, I've bought into that single radius from 10 to 110 the implant design, 14 years of outcome data. Uh, I was fortunate enough to train with uh, several of the guys that were on the implant design team. And so I've got, uh, I've got inside information, I guess you could say, on the implant design. And I really just love uh, all the features uh, that they offer. Does it offer me everything? No. Um, the platform covers 95% of what I want and need. And I think the other 5%, we have great options out there, which I rarely need to go to. But when I do, uh, I do. Dr. Barber? Uh, th this would be a crazy answer uh, from me. And, and you and I have kind of touched on that because I, I use a lot of different systems uh, very much to the frustration of, of everyone around <laughs> me. Um, so I think, one, it's very hard to say that there's a lot of proof um, that we've got you know, one implant to rule them all, um, or you would not see as many on the market and as many coming to market as you do. Um, I was, you know, similar to Paul, I was was trained by a triathlon designer, uh, really good implant, you know, uh, Stryker's gone all in on robotics. Um, and so they've never launched triathlon 2.0. Paul may be developing it right now, but, um, you know, the the lack of uh, narrow uh, femoral sizes, some of the up down size compatibility, things like that, that they've known for quite a while needed to be better. Um, it, it didn't make sense to really do, uh, you know, when when it was probably 2013, 2014, Stuart Simpson can answer that question for you. They had gotten everybody onto that platform. They had put osteonics and Helmetica together the osteonics users had come over from Scorpio, the Halmedica users had come over from Duracon and they had gotten them all on that same platform. So 
you know, they could iterate and do some of those small things or they could go all in on robotics, which is what they did. And I don't know that that was a bad decision. Um, for me, um, I, I like a platform that, you know, from cruciate retaining primary knee all the way up just has seamless steps for me to make the next step, whether that's adding a stem or adding an augment or adding constraint. Love to have a PS plus option available. Love for it to go seamlessly to revision and ideally uh, seamlessly even to a hinged implant from there. Um, I, I, I like and use a lot of different systems. And so um, in addition to kind of the presence that I have, you know, locally from a lot of the big companies, I'm very much involved with a an independent device broker model. So I know I have this rep, if you will, with very deep experience that all those service things that that Paul talked about, I have that across multiple companies. Or if I see something that I that I want or am interested in, go get me that. Have somebody send instruments. Let's take a look at that. And I just know that it's handled. So um, I'm very blessed to be at a, a very uh, private practice, but at a private hospital and private surgery center. And so uh, the ability to to do that and to try a lot of different things is, is wide open for me. Yeah, I will say if I have a criticism of some of the big four or five, it's the pace at which innovation occurs. You know, we we recognize problems. They're known Those problems. Those battleships don't turn quick. They do not. And so you got the deep pockets and the engineering teams and the most talented individuals, you come up with a great idea, you pitch it, everybody loves it, and then it doesn't go anywhere for five years. It's uh, it's extremely frustrating. It also keeps uh, implant companies like Stryker, who never had a metal-on-metal -metal, uh, implant, out of trouble some. Uh, so it, it kind of gets back to that, don't be the first, don't be the last, uh, but certainly second to last isn't great either. So. It I want to ask you guys both a, a question on this. So that's something that you we saw a lot in the spine world where um, adoption of like peak material and then um, I think titanium, you know, came back. So there's all, you know, o always a discussion about the materials for both of you. I mean, you have, I think, you know, you have stainless steel you mentioned, but then there's also biocompatible materials. Do either of you have a preference on material type for your implants or is it i you know i'm sure it's kind of case by case but you must have like some preference you know i i'm in a market for, for whatever reason i'm in an area where a lot of uh, patients have concerns about nickel sensitivity uh, nickel reactions and metal sensitivity and metal reactions and so there is a fair amount of metal testing um, that we do in our office i offer it to every patient and almost no insurance companies cover it anymore. So mainly they're paying out of pocket and they're willing to pay that cost. Metal testing for like, for like aller, aller, allergic reactions? Yep. yep. And I it, really like to term them sensitivities more than allergies because they're not going to make you anaphylactic. They're really just going to somewhat cause some continued irritation. There's a lot of debate. I mean, this is a slippery slope. I'm sure we could have an entire discussion about whether we even believe that nickel or metal sensitivities even exist. But in my practice, if a patient believes that there's the potential for that to occur, the safest thing for me to do is get them the answers and stay out of their way and get them the safest implant that I can get them. I think there's a lot of great options with alternative materials now. We haven't had better options than we do today for you know, ceramic coated implants and alternative materials. Um, and I think it's an exciting time to be able to offer that to patients, even all the way up to a hinged implant. And I can get fully uh, ceramic coated. And the, the exciting part for me about alternative materials is not whether they can eliminate or decrease the, the phenomenon of metal sensitivity, but can we develop a better uh, uh, material that has better ductility, decreased uh, biofilm formation, for instance, and there's some data that um, you know uh, titanium niobium nitride coated implants are more resistant and easier to clear biofilm off of those types of implants than a traditional cobalt chrome implant that to me is the most exciting part of alternative materials not so much avoiding nickel sensitivity per se but 
in doing that, can we come up with a better material that has better wear properties, better ductility, and easier or or you know easier to clear infection? Yeah, uh, we're a lot of the uh, all those things you said. We're, those are kind of in this world of the the unknown unknowns at this point. Where we're not really sure. Uh, my personal bias, kind of in me, uh, when possible, I, I like a titanium base plate um, with a with a roughened surface. Um, ideally, with with some good uh, cement pockets. If you're not doing a cementless implant, um, I, I think some of those uh, really thick, really rigid uh, cobalt chrome base plates have been uh, a little more associated with. Uh, Debonding from cement and from with uh, stress shielding, uh, some of the alternative surfaces you've got the titanium nitride coated implants. Um, of course, oxinium has been around for a long time, and I think what uh, TJO is doing with Arum uh, is interesting as well. Where we're probably going to see some of these, uh, some more of these treated titanium femoral implants, and probably more of a move to to see less cobalt chrome maybe uh, over time. And, you know, we don't know. We don't know what all these these reactivity uh, tests necessarily mean. And I, or there's even talk about genomic testing and how how people may react or be sensitive to certain metals. You know, I think, um, you know, you brought up a, a great point. I, if I'm an implant company or man, implant manufacturer right now, I'm sweating out the fact that all these batteries are being made and certainly cobalt and chrome are a part of that. Um, and as that material gets more scarce, harder to buy um, yep. and more expensive, uh, we better have alternatives uh, and well, I, hopefully you know, better alternatives. Go go the whole other direction. I mean, uh, you know, and certainly in a cost conscious world, there's a lot of discussion about all polyethylene tibias. And uh, you can look at what Max is starting to do with uh, possibly a peak knee. So yeah. um, where we get a, a completely metal free knee at some point, there, there are a lot of, yeah. a lot of potential things out there. Every time I do a, an all poly tibia, I think oh, I got to do more of these. I love this. Right. I love this implant and they look great and they function great and they're easy to get out, which is for a guy like me, but every time I put an implant in, I, the first thing I'm thinking is if I got to get this thing out, can I get it out? Um, and they're easy to get out. Interesting. And with amazing, you know, long-term clinical data. Yeah, and you can't we all, argue. We all talk about this all the time. And then, like you said, we say, oh, we should be doing more of this. And, and we don't. How come? Sean Palmer would be proud of us right now. He'd be the guy yelling, you don't need robots. You need all poly tibias right. and, you know, cobalt, chrome, and cement. There you go. That might be somebody I got to get on. I just, so you find, uh, like, uh, I think I, rec I friend requested him on LinkedIn a while back, but it never, but it just, it just came through and I'm like, oh gosh, I'm like, I'm, I'm connected. So I'll have to hit him up. He, he's, but him and, uh, Dr. Boris are probably my two favorite, uh, like LinkedIn. Uh, I don't want to call them, I don't, I don't think, I don't want to say they troll, but let me tell you, they have the best comments. Well, I, you know, I think we need guys like that who are willing to say, where's the data? You know, yeah. all this technology is great, but it's added cost. It's a potential added risk. And where are the outcomes? And although you need time to have good long-term outcome data, you can't just produce long-term outcome data. I think we need people like that who are, who are willing to stand up in public and say, look, it sounds cool. It's a great idea. It's a marketing uh, ploy uh, at best. And we we don't have any data to support it. Yeah, no, that's well, totally one hundred percent. I love getting in these discussions, talking about what you're trying. That you know, maybe we don't have a mountain of evidence on yet, but I want to know your experience because you're Paul Jacob, and I want to hear about it, and I want to have these discussions. But that guy, Sean, keeps everything intellectually honest for us. Uh, it's going to call people out on their BS and and keep keep these discussions uh, centered in a good way. Mm -hmm. 100%. Well, gentlemen, we're at the top of the hour. We're going to round things out. We're, we're, we're almost through, and I really appreciate you guys coming on. So we got uh, soft tissue balance and patellar tracking, which uh, I think there's a lot of choices there to go with. But um, Dr. Barber, why don't you kick it off? We're just done. Like soft tissue is the whole operation. Uh, that, that's, that's it. That's what we're chasing. Um, and, and it's, you know, we use that old quote, the, 
there's a thousand ways to get it wrong and only one way to get it right. And I, I, I don't believe that. I think there's a lot of ways to get it right, but I think it's that, that holy grail of, of soft tissue balancing, balance and stability throughout a range of motion that feels natural to a patient. And regrettably, I think there probably are a lot of different ways to get there, but systemizing those and making those reproducible is the, the challenge. Yeah, and for, I think, guys like Matt and I, the, it's essential as the boomers come through and we're increasing exponentially in the need for total knees. And those total knees are being done all over the country by guys who do 20 a year and guys who do, you know, 1,200 a year. We need to level that playing surface so that the revision burden doesn't overwhelm us. Um, and it's, it, I can see it coming in my practice for sure. Um, and uh, I think the somewhat standardization of the outcome, which is really what we're looking for, how you get uh, to the, the balance of a knee is less essential to me than the actual outcome itself. I don't care whether you call it kinematics or, or reverse kinematic alignment or whatever you want to call it. You can call it your last name's alignment That for all I care. If you get me to a balanced knee at the end of the day, every time I'll do your technique and call it whatever you want me to call it. Um, but I'm chasing the outcome and anything that I think is going to lower revision burden and across the country is something I put a lot of effort in. And I think robotics helps us get there. Um, but whatever, whatever technique you use to get to the outcome, uh, is okay with me as long as the outcome is what we're shooting for. I think that's great. Nothing else to add add on here. I I, I was kind of curious to see if like so uh, so Dr. Jacob again you you mentioned patella tracking especially robotics. Um, Dr. Barbara on patella tracking. I mean I know you probably have like different approaches. Is there one that you prefer over the other? I'll well, be careful how I say this. I, I think some hey, things I'm about. Glad I'm, asking, I'm, I'm glad I'm asking good questions because I'll tell you, like, I had to pull out some like old medical school textbooks. I'm like, man, I haven't, I haven't done anything in totally in so long, so I need to know what the hell it asks. So I'm glad I'm asking. Okay, go. I'm just very happy I asked a good question. I think some of our our consideration and discussion about patellar tracking is overblown, um, and I mean that that historically. That answer on an OITE exam was what's the most common complication. And I really, it's not that anymore. And I'm not sure that it ever was. I think a lot of those were instability issues and other things that were being diagnosed incorrectly um, that, that speak to femoral component rotation and a lot of different things. Now, I think we need to be looking at it. I think we need to know how kinematic alignment affects it. Um, Andy Wickline has talked about that as a as a compartment and the amount of, of of bone and what we're what we're taking away and what we're replacing there and I I think that is valid as well uh, but I, I find that if I if I put things where they're supposed to be you know and whatever that is I, I don't really find that I have a lot of tracking issues yeah I think the patella is the verification that you did whatever you are trying to accomplish it by balancing your knee correctly. When that patella tracks and smooth and beautiful at the end of that case, it's a really reassuring thing. Um, but as the a resident, it's probably, correct in the joint lines where it's supposed to be. That's right. Yeah. As a resident, I probably paid the least amount of attention. That was the end of the case. You know, you didn't you just took the saw, you made your cut where you thought it was and you cemented a, it was something I paid very little attention to. And I, I deeply consider the patellofemoral compartment in, in a total knee now um, more for reassurance uh, at the end of a procedure than, than anything else, but pay a lot of attention. Fantastic. And uh, just to kind of wrap it up, I mean, I think this is going to be, I mean, I think that this will be the shortest uh, answer of the, of the show. Maybe I'm wrong, though. But in terms of like closure techniques and post-op care, but, you know, Closure techniques, you have, you have staples, you have reabsorbable uh, stitches. Is there, is there anything that you particularly like? I mean, I don't know. A stitch is a stitch, but I could be wrong. There could be some amazing stitch technology out there. But what, what, what do you guys prefer? You know, for me, it's pace. So, uh, you know, I'm a busy guy. I run two ORs. I do, you know, about eight, eight or ten primary joints a day, five days a week. And so I want to be able to close confidently and efficiently. Uh, Barb suture is for me. I'm a Stratifix guy. Uh, I'm not so fixated on the 
type or the manufacturer of the barb suture as as I am the ability to close confidently and quickly uh, a total knee. And for me, that's that's where I'm at. And I'm I'm an avid avoider of staples. I can't stand staples. Um, certainly makes my closure faster. Um, but I like uh, zip closure devices and other devices that try and reproduce what a staple does without having to clip that metal through the skin. Yeah, so just close it good, watertight. I use uh, uh, barbed uh, running suture as well, over sew things, uh, quills specifically. Um, use some staples on the, the really large or those with really tight skin, but a lot of uh, running absorbable uh, subcuticular is, is our, our common closure for that. Um, and then the post-operative care is a whole nother episode and that may be, um, almost as important. Yeah, no, I, I told, I told you, well, gentlemen, I really appreciate, uh, you joining the show and, and we had a lot of fun. I'm definitely going to have you back. I want to thank the audience and I want to remind you all, um, if you are a, a clinician, you do get a CME credit uh, that you have to reflect on, by the way. So just to help you all out, if you're listening to this on the road or on replay, um, to unlock your CME credit, you got to go to earnc.me. So that's earnc.me forward slash capital K, capital N is Nancy, and then lowercase WPVW. Or just check the show notes below and you'll see a link there. I want to thank you all. I'm, on, I'm your host, Omar M. Khatib. This is another episode of the State of MedTech. And we'll see you all next time. Bye for now and have a good evening. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of the State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor. Hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has an executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care. See you next time.